American, I'm executive director of Young Coxit. Can you see there? Wow. And um, I just want to first, before I introduce our wonderful panel here, um, say that this panel came about because we have a serious problem with involuntary pesticide chemical exposures here in our state, in particular our county here in Lane County. A uh, lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it is due to the use of pesticides in forestry, the use of pesticides by our own government on public lands, and that's not even to mention the use of pesticides in industrial farming. You didn't start without me. Thanks. <laughs> And because of the concern, um, many of us have put together the Oregon Pesticide Action Work Group, which was a catalyst to come up with the idea for this panel. Uh, this group has been meeting now four years, coming up with creative solutions to the problem of chemical exposure, pesticide drift. And we do this throughout the state. And if uh, you were in the keynote speaker, Tyrone, Dr. Tyrone Hayes, speaking about atrazine, one of the chemicals that has been found in the bodies of people here in Oregon. You may be able to imagine how devastating the people are feeling who have fought against this for decades right here in this area of Oregon, starting back in the 70s some very courageous women in this part of Oregon. And the battle, and unfortunately it is, the battle continues on. The latest uh, salvo, I suppose, is that um, residents in Lane County in the Triangle Lake, Triangle Lake area have been complaining about exposures from aerial forestry spray. And I'm going to just leap over a lot of the detail in Aaron will maybe likely get into some more of the detail. Um, protested loudly enough where the state finally said, okay, we'll test uh, your urine. And uh, indeed, after the 24D was found with the urine of residents, including children, from the ages of like 70 to 70. And um, they are, I have a lot of emotion about this. The study um, is being thwarted by the timber industries, who now are saying, well, we're not going to allow this study to proceed on a good scientific basis, good, good, good scientific protocol, because they'll be, in a, in a sense, indicted by public opinion when these chemicals are found. And so uh, they're refusing to uh, spray in the areas that the state and the federal government have spent so much money to test. They're not spraying the two chemicals yeah. that we tested for. Yeah. They're spraying other chemicals. Good point. Yeah, yeah. good point. And uh, those are the two chemicals that are easy to test. So just want to say, as of last week, that was the new development is that the uh, forestry companies are refusing to I don't know if I want to say cooperate, but they're trying to try to thwart it successfully. So a very valid investigation because those people that, like Aaron, volunteered to participate in the study, now the data can't be really used. Really so it's it's frustrating, it's depressing, it's uh, needs legal solutions. I know some people are trying to go that route and we have some folks here to talk about it. So Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel in the order of speakers. We have on far left attorney David Force. He has a long career in uh, Oregon. He started off, uh, he's a native, so he started off here, graduated from U of O Law School in 82, uh, was a reporter for the Medford Mail Tribune, so he knows local issues, and has been practicing law in Eugene. Uh, primarily plaintiff's civil practice and has been brave enough to take on uh, some of these chemical trespass cases. Daniel Snyder is uh, next to David Force there and he's with the law offices of 
Charles Tebbett, who won the great award last night at the ceremony, and he is focused, his uh, practice is focused on public interest and family law, and he has been representing individuals, regional grassroots organizations, national nonprofits in their efforts to enforce state and federal environmental statutes. He'll be focusing on Oregon right to farm law. And we have Dr. Thomas Kearns right here. Um, I'm proud to say Dr. Kearns is a member of the Beyond Practice Board. He's also the Director of Environmental and Human Rights Advisory and graduated uh, from Notre Dame with a BA um, and went on to get his PhD in philosophy, uh, uh, receiving a Fulbright Hayes scholarship uh, to study issues that we'll talk to you about. And uh, he has been a prolific author on the subject of human rights as a way to address chemical trespass. So we'll be here from a human rights perspective. And then Aaron King, who I'm really proud to know and to work with. Aaron is a resident here in Triangle Lake, Lake County. She's a mom of two beautiful boys and uh, has a wonderful husband, Justice. And uh, she has been the consummate advocate, activist, uh, forward thinker, creative uh, scientist, and I'm really glad she's here to talk about that. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to sit to do this. I presume everybody is. I hope you can hear me. Uh, the slide shows uh, what I'm going to be talking about. The uh, brochure uh, says that my topic is uh, constitutional challenges to pesticide regulations. That's not exactly right, but my topic is constitutional challenges to pesticide non-regulation. Uh, and you know, this there, there has been, as long as I can remember, uh, an illusion in uh, the media and I think in the general public, uh, both in the state and nationally, that's been very carefully fostered by the, by the resource exploitation industries that uh, Oregon heavily regulates environmental risks and harms. Uh, uh, frankly, uh, in my view at least for the last 20 years, uh, the Oregon state government has been pretty actively hostile to regulation, not pollution. Uh, but the topic that I'm presenting has to do with the fact that, at least in some senses, I believe that to be unconstitutional, and I'm representing a group of people who are uh, taking that approach. Uh, this is Section 10 of the Oregon Constitution, of Article 1 of the Oregon Constitution. Article 1 is the Bill of Rights. It uh, lists all the rights pretty much that are in the Federal Bill of Rights and a number of others, some a little unique. Uh, Article 22 is passed uh, in the 30s uh, when Oregon was the first state to repeal prohibition. And uh, Article 22 of the Oregon Art Art Section 22 of Article 1 of the Oregon Bill of Rights gives every Oregonian over 21 uh, a right to liquor by the drink. I don't think I can. I tried. Maybe. Oh, okay. All right. Now, how do I get back to it? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Great. Anyway, Article 1, Section 10 is a, is a state constitutional provision that uh, originated uh, in the Indiana Constitution in 1819 and was adopted by the people who, whoops, who wrote the uh, Oregon Constitution in uh, 1857. And it says, uh, no court shall be secret, etc. And it's the last three lines that matter in this context. Every man, or every person now, shall have remedy by due course of law for injury done him in his person, property, or reputation. And in a case decided by the Oregon Supreme Court in 2001 called Smothers versus Gresham Transfer, uh, 
the Oregon Supreme Court interpreted that provision very broadly. It's in the bold face there in the first paragraph of that excerpt. The legislature lacks authority to deny a remedy for injury to absolute rights that existed when the Oregon Constitution was adopted in 1857. That means if under the common law, which is law that's not made by legislatures or parliaments or Congress, it's made by courts on a case-by-case -case basis, but if under the common law, at the time of Oregon statehood, uh, people had some fundamental right, then the Oregon legislature does not have the authority to impair or take away that right. Uh, and there are two common law rights uh, that were very well established by the time of Oregon statehood. Uh, trespass is a common law tort that provides a remedy in money damages for an intrusion by someone onto the land, the property, real property of another. Uh, and since the early 1700s in Britain and the, U and the American colonies, uh, that includes cases of intrusion not just by somebody actually going onto your property physically, but by substances, fumes, gases, smoke, odors, and poisons. And that has been recognized as a common law right to, with a remedy and damages by the Oregon Supreme Court since 1929. And in fact, in 1961, the Oregon Supreme Court concluded that chemical spraying on someone's land that spread onto another's land was a trespass. Uh, and that's the case of Lowe versus Lemon. Nuisance is another uh, common law tort. Provides a remedy in money damages for interference with a person's use and enjoyment of their property. So it's a personal right rather than a property right. Uh, and that also includes, uh, it was recognized at common law in the United States by at least 1840. That actually was a U.S. Supreme Court case in 1840 uh, and in, uh, in New York, out of New York. But uh, the, so everybody believed ever since Oregon statehood that if somebody trespassed on your property, including by substances, fumes, gases, smoke, odors, or poisons, or interfered with your enjoyment of property by uh, poisoning your well, for example, uh, that you could do something about it. But in the 1990s in Oregon, the legislature decided that wasn't a good idea. And they passed a series of laws called the Right to Farm and Right to Forest Acts uh, on behalf of commercial forestry companies and agribusiness. And part of that statute that's up there is, says, no farming or forest practice on lands zoned for farm or forest use shall give rise to any private right of action or claim for relief based on nuisance or trespass. Okay. And these are the definitions of the terms in the Freedom to Farm and Freedom to Forest Act. Uh, farming practice means a mode of operation that is or may be used on a farm, is generally accepted reasonable <coughs> prudent method for the operation of the farm to obtain a profit in money, is or may become a generally accepted reasonable and prudent method in conjunction with farm use, complies with applicable laws, is done in a reasonable and prudent manner. Uh, same thing for forest practices. Uh, and uh, may, down at number F, may include but is not limited to site preparation, timber harvest, slash disposal, road construction and maintenance, tree planting, pre-commercial thinning, release fertilization, animal damage control, and insect and disease control. And by pesticides. Uh, now this is the part of those statutes that 
I find particularly appalling. The state of Oregon uh, is legally required by contract and statute to uh, enforce uh, pesticide and herbicide regulations on behalf of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. But they don't, and they don't because of this statute, which says uh, the State Department of Agriculture may adopt rules, the State Department, the State Forestry Department may adopt rules. They have adopted some rules, but mainly they just do what it says in ORS 30.943. The Department of Environmental Quality, Department of State Lands, State Department of Agriculture, or State Forestry Department is not required to investigate complaints if the agency has reason to believe that the complaint is based on <coughs> practices protected by ORS 30.30. So all I have to say is that might be a, form, a farming practice or a forestry practice and you can't complain about it, even though it violates the law. This is uh, Oregon's public policy with regard to pesticides and herbicides. Uh, farming and forest practices are critical to the economic welfare of this state. I don't say anything about human beings, just farming and forest practices. Uh, the legislature declares it as policy of this state that farming practices must be protected, forest practices must be protected, persons who locate on or near an area zoned for farm or forest use must accept the conditions commonly associated with living in that setting, and certain private rights of actions and the authority of local governments and special districts to declare farming and pra forest practices to be nuisance or trespass must be limited because such claims for relief are inconsistent with, and have adverse effects on the continuation of farming and forest practices. It's based on the state. So there are no human rights in here. There are only rights to make money from the resource base of the state. Uh, pesticides are good, according to the Oregon legislature. Uh, The use of a pesticide shall be considered to be a farming practice or a forestry <coughs> practice, notwithstanding any other law uh, under, under these circumstances. Uh, pesticides are really special. Uh, there's all kinds of forest and farming practices that might cause a trespass, but uh, Nuisance or trespass includes but is not limited to actions or claims based on noise, vibration, odor, smoke, dust, mist from irrigation, use of pesticides, and use of crop production substances. So. Finally, there's this other provision of the Oregon Constitution. This is Article 1, Section 20. It says, no law shall be passed granting to any citizen or class of citizens privileges or immunities which upon the same terms shall not equally belong to all citizens. Now, to my knowledge, there's no litigation involving that section and uh, the state statutes prohibiting protection of people against uh, forest or uh, pesticide trespass. Uh, at this time, and there's, from my standpoint, there's a reason for that. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't tried that because over the years, the, the Oregon Supreme Court has interpreted that provision very narrowly and, in fact, differently than it was intended by the founders of the state. Uh, the Oregon Supreme Court has interpreted that to apply only to what they call uh, inherent classes. That is, classes of people that are inherently different such uh, from birth. Uh, racial or sexual discrimination, that sort of thing. And in fact, this is also from the uh, Indiana Constitution of 1819. And before that, a few years earlier, it was an amendment to the Constitution of New York. And it was to abolish what was called in New York State poltroonage. 
when New York became a state, it maintained a feudal system from the Dutch that had been promised by the British Crown in the upper uh, Hudson Valley. And there were feudal lords up there called poltroons. And New York passed a constitutional amendment that abolished poltroonage, and this is the basis of that constitutional provision in New York, then up in <coughs> Indiana, and then in Oregon. And in my view, it clearly means that even if you weren't born poor or born rich, you can't say that somebody who is, for example, born rich or born or acquires uh, several hundred acres of commercial forest land is not different from somebody who lives next to that forest land. And that the, pr that the person who owns the forest land or, the, or a farm, commercial farm, should not have a privilege or immunity against claims for trespass that don't belong to the person next door. You see, it, 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 these statutes only apply when the person, when the parties who are doing the pollution, are operating from ownership of zone farm or forest land. So they don't apply at all in cities, for example, because there's no zone farm or forest land in cities. If your neighbor here in Eugene sprays a bunch of Roundup over his fence and kills all your rose bushes, you can sue him. But if he did that out in the country and his house was on a farm and he did the very same thing, you can't. Uh, whether this is something that can be resolved in the courts, we're hoping to find out. The uh, case is going up to the Oregon Court of Appeals right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, presumably the, the ultimate uh, remedy to this kind of situation is the political one. Okay. Two minutes left or I've gone over two minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the ultimate remedy I think is going to have to be a political one because people don't seem to realize they don't believe it until it happens to them. Uh, and it's true unfortunately of a number of things about the legal regimen in the state of Oregon. People don't believe uh, that they lose all their constitutional rights uh, if they file a workers' compensation claim, but they do uh, in Oregon. So, and, and uh, people don't believe that if they happen to live next door to an irresponsible uh, commercial farm or commercial forestry operation, they lose their human rights against being poisoned, but they do. Hopefully someone will do about that. Something is going to be done about that. Hasn't yet. Thank you. Yeah, I need to pull that okay. cord. Okay, great. <coughs> and I'm so sorry to interrupt David to give the time, but I want to make sure all of our speakers have a chance and oh, I was done. A chance to ask <laughs> questions, too. And maybe while they're switching, that's a good moment for me to just mention I'm on a panel at four in the other the law school, so if I jet out of here early, I asked Tom to just help with the questions and answers if you want. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> so my, my PowerPoint isn't going to be as pretty as David's, unfortunately. <laughs> it even works here. Okay, you uh, use F yeah, F5. That, that one doesn't work on the Mac, unfortunately. <laughs> Unsupported signals just get slower the one you saw in the long run. Yeah, that's the first case of subdivision between those two stores. Hot form, dairy form. You might have to adjust your resolution as you can. Stench. Short. I don't know if it's not a chemical mask. Trust me. It's more fun to sit well. The farm's been here for a while. Not fast enough, so I'm just going to go without the presentation here and I'll just. Wing it. 
That's what it's all about, right? So my name is Dan Snyder. Um, I'm going to be talking about issues with Oregon's current notification process for pesticides, as well as some other potential legal challenges to the current pesticide regime that exists in Oregon. A uh, regime, what you just heard David say, is patently unconstitutional. Uh, and, I, and I think that most people who take a close look at this would agree that it violates the Constitution right now. Um, and you know, the best of luck to you in your case, and I hope that you prove that. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the problem goes beyond that. It also extends to the notification process as it exists currently. Uh, how many people here live close to a clear cut? And how many people receive notices of pesticide applications? Yeah, that's about half. Um, you have to buy them. You have to buy them. That's, that's how it works right now. To get notice that your neighbor is going to apply poisons next door, you actually have to call up ODF or go to their website and buy a subscription. Under the current law, the pesticide applicator doesn't have to tell you what they're applying, when they're applying, or how they're going to apply, unless you get that from the state agency. Uh, and you have to pay for it. Uh, it's five dollars per section, and a section is generally about one square mile. Uh, but the minimum requirement is twenty-five dollars. So you have to basically buy five sections, and it's only good for a certain period of time. Now, you would think with that you might have at least some shot of knowing what's going to happen on your neighbor's property or what they're going to be spraying. But unfortunately, the problems go far beyond that. Uh, the notices generally identify who's spraying, what they're going to spray and the expected time frame, but it's a little more ambiguous. And if the slideshow worked right now, I'd be showing you an example of one of these notices. And I'll just sit up there. Yes, no, I, I asked Erin to see if she could get hers ready. Hers isn't working, but I don't know why yours is not working. Yeah, that's OK. Um, so the time frame on these things, you'll get a notice that'll say, me, pesticide applicator, I'm going to be applying between August and December. <laughs> One of those days it's going to work when the weather permits. So as a neighboring landowner, you have no idea when they're actually going to apply until you usually wake up in your helicopters and you look out your window and you see them spraying. Uh, on top of that, they usually list uh, uh, every chemical they could possibly use because they don't want to have to make a decision ahead of time of what specific chemicals they're going to use. So uh, in one case, in in Fox Hollow, Justina Timber, they had a notice like this. And their notice said that they may apply Oust XP, Oust Extra, Accord, Polaris SP, Galeron 3A, Galeron 4, Escort, Milestone VM Plus, and potentially some other ones. Now, all of these are very dangerous chemicals. Uh, you actually have to have a federally approved license to even handle this stuff, usually. Herbicides? Yes. Herbicides. These are herbicides, pesticides, and I believe one is actually a uh, uh, fungicide that they're looking at playing too. It, some of these actually are broad spectrum, so they handle a lot of things, and those are even worse. Um, so as a neighbor, you go, okay, they're going to apply everything, or one of these things. You don't know what's going to happen. And as I just said, the notifier doesn't actually have to specify what the specific date of application is going to be. So you pay for these subscriptions, and you basically learn nothing useful. Sometimes, if you are close enough with the industry that's going to be applying them, you can call up their forester and say, hey, would you mind giving me some notice? And if uh, they like you, they may decide to give you a call and let you know when they're going to apply. Um, they may tell you that, and they may just not do it. Uh, it it's a fundamental problem right now. It, and it, the really interesting thing is, usually when uh, your neighbor is going to do something on their property that could potentially affect you, they have to get a permit, and they actually have to tell you, and you get your own specific notice. Uh, you know, building permits happen that way. A lot of fuel burning permits, not in this state, but other states happen that way. You have to get a notice, and your neighbor has to come and say, hey, by the way, I'm fuel burning, I'm going to do it between this hour and this hour, and this is what's going to happen. And here you don't have to do that at all. Outside of the pre-spray notices, Oregon law requires applicators to actually document what occurs during a spray. And they have to, it's, it's an o Oregon administrative rule, and if anybody's interested in a specific one, I'd be happy to tell you afterwards, but uh, the rule requires them to take detailed daily records. And the records must, must evidence 
the acreage that they actually applied to, the name of the chemicals they used, the actual, the actual date and time of the application, and then things that pertain to drift, which is obviously one of the major concerns from helicopter sprays and ground-based sprays depending on your location. And those include air temperature, relative humidity, the wind velocity and direction, that being particularly important, and the name of the person that actually made the application. Sometimes these companies will list an applicator, but then someone else will actually go out and do it, which is very illegal, but they can get away with it. And the big problem is they have these this directive that says you have to keep track of this stuff, but they don't actually make these records public. Uh, supposedly in each forest company there is a filing cabinet that has, you pull it out and there should be volumes of these, of this, these records, but the rule doesn't require them to actually give them to ODF afterwards. So ODF, the agency that's ostensibly supposed to be monitoring and regulating the industry, says, okay, you guys just tell us generally what you're going to do, and then you keep the specific records, and that's fine. You don't actually have to give them to us. Which, as the public, that means we don't have a right to know what was actually done on that property. Unless you sue a timber company and you use Discovery or something like that to get it. Now, the records can be requested by the state forester. Uh, from my understanding, this is rarely, if ever, done. And I don't want to steal any of Aaron's thunder, but with the Triangle Lake study, it, it, it has been preposterous how difficult it is to get these records. Uh, the agencies specifically have said, and, and ODF personnel have said, you know what, it's going to be too onerous on the, on the industry to request them. This is an unduly burdensome request. And it, it just blows my mind because it should be as simple as, all right, open the filing cabinet, here you go, there's the records. But that's too much to ask for the, the agency. Um, so, and, and if that did occur, then those would become public records, and us as the public could get them through Oregon's right to know laws, which uh, many landowners, especially people who raised their hands earlier, would like to know what exactly their neighbors are spraying and what they have been exposed to. Uh, it's, it's a very perverse system how it's set up right now. And it's set up this way because the industry has been lobbying to do this for four years. They've got a long head start. Here. So what, what do you do? Um, you know, let's say you get the subscription and you actually get information that says your neighbor is going to be applying pesticides. Uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to get informed. You've got you to gotta know your rights. There are groups here that can tell you your rights. Uh, you can consult attorneys who will also tell you your rights as well. There's also a pesticide application preparedness form that, that some of us prepared, and we would gladly distribute that. I don't know if we have any copies with us right now, but it is available on Forest Land Dweller's website, and it gives you a detailed explanation on what to do when you get one of these notices. And right now, one of the most important things to do is to document everything. You need to go and you need to take a close look. Is there a stream? There's specific rules for applicators on how close they can apply to streams. There's supposed to be buffer zones. Uh, you know, pay attention to that stuff. Walk the site. See what's going on. Obviously, don't trespass, though, because these guys get really pissed when you walk on their property. Um, and then... It, it, and you're not immune. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah and, you're, and you're not immune. They will go after you. Uh, there have been... Threats of deadly force in the past amongst people, so you have to be really careful. Um, and the, the form that I mentioned earlier will also explain how you can document evidence of drift. And and there are there are resources available should you request them for things like a drift catcher, which is a device that will document drift as it comes down a hill or over a helicopter. Uh, and then I have this beautiful screenshot of our form, but of course it's not going to work. Uh, another thing you can do, which is what we're trying to advocate, is, is get involved in the legislative process. You know, you heard David say, if it's not going to be the court, it's got to be something that's going to be legislative. You know, call up your reps and say, hey, this is unfair and it's unconstitutional, and I deserve a right to know what's happening on my neighbor's property. Uh, we have been in contact with some people in the legislature, and we'd like to change the system. Um, the number one point being, you shouldn't have to pay for these things. It should be free, and it should be by law required that an applicator has to go and knock on your door and say, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, we, we are also advocating that the system be changed so that 
not only do they have to give you, say, 30 days notice and of a specific date that they're going to apply, or at least maybe a five to ten day time frame, but they also have to ask you, how would you like to get 24 hour notice? Do you want a phone call? Do you want an email? Do you want a text message? It's very simple. Or even better, just put it online. It's really easy to do. ODF is way behind the times on this, and there's a reason for it, unfortunately. And of course, it's always good to obtain legal advice, too. I mentioned earlier the Fox Hollow incident um, with Justina Timber. Uh, my firm wrote a letter to Justina's, uh, the whole company, actually, and, and the individuals here in town. And we said we represent a number of individuals who uh, are your neighbors who are very concerned about what's going to happen. And uh, unfortunately, they kind of said, screw you guys, we don't care. And they sprayed. And actually, we found out our response to the letter. This was on, on the news as well. They're spraying right now. Um, and you know, it's a good threat. This is an ultra-hazardous activity. That means that there is no li there's absolute liability if something happens, but uh, the legislature gave them this nice shield in the Oregon Right to Farm Act so they can protect themselves. So, briefly, I just I only have about a minute and a half left. Um, assuming the Oregon Right to Farm Law stays in existence, uh, there are some potential other avenues you can look at for getting redress if you actually are injured. Um, one that I have been playing around with is water rights in Oregon. You have, if you have a verifiable water right, that is if you have a stream that comes through and you actually have a piece of paper from the Oregon, I forget exactly what department it is, water, that, resources. water resources that says you can do that, you might have an opportunity to go after them for polluting them. Um, crop damage is also one that you go after before, but there's uh, a little bit of ambiguity of whether there's a claim requirement you have to make. Right now, the rules say you have to give 60 days notice that you're going to sue them for crop damage. And a, a lower court here in Oregon held that unconstitutional. But uh, ODF is still saying you have to do it, which just blows me away. I mean, a court says you can't, they're not required, but ODF says you have to do it. And then potentially the most exciting new avenue is the Clean Water Act. Uh, a few years ago, in a case called National Cotton Council versus EPA, the Sixth Circuit held that pesticide applicators are required to have a Clean Water Act permit for any discharges that are on, near, or above water. Uh, and that's water that, that is jurisdictional in the Clean Water Act, which is actually pretty broad. So if you can document someone flying overhead and spraying into a stream, you may potentially have a Clean Water Act cause of action. And the Clean Water Act carries with it civil penalties of $37,500 per violation. So if you see them crisscrossing this thing, well, that adds up, and that's a very, very powerful disincentive to the industry. If you get a, they get a notice that says, "Hey, we're going to sue you, and this is what you're potentially liable for." Uh, it's National Cotton Council versus EPA, and it's actually a case that Charlie Tebbit litigated. Um, but unfortunately, the Right to Farm Act is in existence. It is a bar right now to any type of redress that citizens should be allowed to do, and again, I, best of luck to David, and I hope we can get it knocked out. <laughs> That's all I have for now. Thank you. I'm supposed to have 15 minutes, so I definitely can get that. Uh, the uh, Environment and Human Rights uh, Movement has kind of exploded onto the, onto the environmental scene in the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, it barely existed before that, and as such that if you, it, I did a Google search uh, a dozen years ago for those two terms, environment and human rights, and came up with zero. Uh, and now if you do a, a Google search for those same two terms, you'll come up with several hundred million hits. Uh, there are uh, books, uh, conferences, uh, organizations, and so on. Um, so up until the, this year, I've been referring to it as a burgeoning movement, but it's not really a movement. Anymore. A book arrived uh, in my mailbox a couple weeks ago that's now a history of the mm -hmm. environment and human rights movement, authored by a person who spoke uh, earlier today. And so uh, uh, the human rights approach to environmental standards, to, to environmental uh, issues, is becoming uh, a standard, kind of a, a lingua franca of, of how to think about um, environmental issues like unwanted toxic exposure. So what I'd like to do is tell you um, it, it's a legal and moral 
movement. Those are sort of two different dimensions of human life. And uh, I'm a philosophy professor, so I'm going to talk mostly about the uh, moral dimension. Uh, so <coughs> if you want to include uh, a human rights dimension <coughs> to your effort, if you're, you've been exposed, you're in a, you've got a project, an issue going on, you want to fight it. If you want to do that, the, the first step, that's so why I want to just tell you what some of the steps are for this. Uh, the first step is to get an assessment, a human rights assessment of that situation. That means what human rights norms, international documentable norms, apply to that particular situation. At this point, um, there's uh, one organization, an organization that I started a few years ago, Environment Human Rights Advisory, that'll do an assessment like that. I'm sure there's going to be more organizations in the future. and. Uh, it's a fairly standard procedure, and so uh, uh, by studying some of the reports that EHRA has developed, you could be able to develop your own. Um, these, so I brought some examples here of uh, four or five uh, reports that you can take. Uh, they're fairly rich documents. They've got five different pieces to them. One is is the facts of the situation, and these are the, the, the facts that are included are undisputable facts. They're facts that if the, I don't know what to call the bad guys, I keep calling, calling them perpetrators. The <laughs> perps, uh, okay. um, they're facts that they would also acknowledge are true, so they're, they're not really in dispute. The second section is on concerns that the community has. So these are concerns like health concerns and economic concerns and so on. And uh, those are givens too, and I, I developed those from conversations with the affected community and by familiarity with the literature and so on. Then the third and largest part is a list of a detailing of 20 some human rights norms from human rights treaties and conventions and documents that may be applicable to this particular situation, whether it's an aerial spray or uh, just finished a report on fracking uh, or um, uh, the biomass uh, situation in uh, West Eugene. So human rights norms that would ap may apply in this situation, what document, what treaty or convention they derive from, and what the details of how that norm, that specific norm, would apply to the situation. And then uh, the fourth section is liabilities that this organization, a company, or an agency maybe. Some of these reports have been written to um, private companies, uh, like one over near Waldport was addressed to a, a, company, a forest products company that was going to do an area of spray near Waldport. And some are addressed to agencies who regulate or are supposed to regulate uh, those private companies. So the fourth section is uh, liabilities that could be faced by that company or that agency, and they're not they're not nothing. And then the fifth are uh, measures that that company or that agency could take to minimize their liability. So the, these reports are presented as a, as a sort of informational piece for an agency that might be interested in avoiding uh, abridging human rights in office. So what would you do if you, once you've got uh, a report like this? Um, I've got one of these handouts here that you can take is, is called Leveraging Your Human Rights Report, things you can do to sort of make it work for you in the community. Um, and then there are some larger, bigger projects that could be done. I, I'm going to list four. Um, one is tribunals, one is citizens' inquiries, one's litigation, and one's legislation. So just briefly, each one of those. Uh, tribunals, the nice thing about, uh, well, there's, let's just back up here. There's some difficulties with legislation. Uh, it's fantastic when it works. Legislation is fantastic when it works because it can compel behavior. Um, but in order to do that, you need laws that are applicable. And we've seen in Oregon here that we're lacking in some, some laws, maybe. Um, 
So if those laws are available, if they can be enforced, if you can afford uh, an attorney, if the case is decided in your favor, if the decision in your favor stands, to then the benefit of a, legis of a uh, litigating approach is that it can compel behavior. Um, but it's expensive and sometimes it doesn't work. So tribunal, citizens tribunal. So the citizens tribunal is, there's only been one in the world so far. It happened in India in December. And it was um, a, a tribunal uh, with jurists from around the world who sat on a, a, a jury trying six of the major, the six major pesticide uh, manufacturers and three international um, organizations, WTO and somebody else, and a couple of nations. I think. So these guys were trying these entities against human rights treaties and conventions. That tr tribunal, citizens tribunal, put on by people, citizens, they didn't have to get anybody's okay, they didn't have to get approval, they just took the power. And if you've ever been involved in an uh, environmental exposure situation, like, you know how powerless you feel. It's just like the roads are closed, you don't know which, how, how to proceed, what you can do to help yourself. And so, if there's a situation, if there's something that citizens can take on by themselves, like a tribunal, and so take the power back into their own hand, that, that's one possible thing. So, a citizens' tribunal, the outcome of that would be a verdict. Um, a citizens' inquiry is another approach. There's only been one of those done in the world, too, so far. It was done in 2006 in New Zealand. And it was about aerial pesticide sprays that had been going on for two and a half years. Every few weeks for two and a half years, the helicopters can spray parts of populated Auckland. And the uh, very uh, outraged uh, community couldn't get any purchase with their the ministries that, that uh, would normally regulate that. And so they decided to put on their own inquiry. So they brought in uh, commissioners from uh, around the world, a physician, uh, a philosophy professor, um, Maori, a Maori elder, a Maori um, attorney, um, and uh, held their uh, own inquiry for five days. And uh, that issued in a report. So the tribunal can issue in a verdict and a, and a, an inquiry can issue in a report. That can then be taken, used in uh, so that's two things. The third possibility is litigation. I'm, I'm sort of imagining that there's going to be an attorney somewhere who's going to take one of these reports and l look at this list of 20-some uh, human rights standards that may be applicable in this, these cases and see what can be done with them in domestic law. And then, of course, if it doesn't work, if you don't get remedy in domestic law, then there are international. Uh, human rights courts, uh, the one for our areas uh, uh, in uh, South America, and Argentina, the international, the inter-American human rights court. So that's litigation. Um, the fourth thing that you could do with a report like this is um, legislation. It's trying to get um, take it to legislators and, and uh, use it as a, a set of talking points. To try to get legislation change. Uh, a fifth idea that just occurred to me today mm -hmm. from uh, this uh, earlier panel on human rights um, by the author of that history of the human rights movement is constitutional change. So, um, uh, and he, he has studied both constitutions of nations. <coughs> 190-some nations in the world, and uh, over 100 of them have some kind of, as part of their constitution, some uh, right to help the environment, including some version of it. And one of the things he uh, studied as part of his doctoral 
dissertation on this was whether nations that have that as part of their constitution, whether that improves environmentally friendly legislation, whether that makes that any better, and whether it impacts litigation at all. We found that it does in fact improve uh, legislation quite a bit, and it improves litigation outcomes a little bit, and it improves um, environmental outcomes also. So applying some of this to not to our style, I didn't anticipate that our national constitution would want to change that very readily, but some state constitutions, there's four or five state constitutions in the U.S. that include an environmental element to the, in their constitutions, or doesn't, but maybe we should try and get them to. No. I think that's all I've got. Would you like me to hand out your sheet? All right, well, while that's going on, um, so I have this video footage that I put together for the Board of Forestry because a lot of my work has been towards the Board of Forestry because I'm surrounded by forest. And um, <clears throat> so this was geared toward buffer zones to show that, yes, we do need buffer zones. There's buffer zones around creeks for fish, but there are no buffer zones around homes or schools. So um, all these are scenes of helicopter spraying. Most of them are. I probably won't have the sound on. This is why I got in this fight, because um, as you can see on this first one right here, um, this is filmed from my house. And you can barely see the helicopter. It's down below. I'm not going to see it at all with that guy over there. There we go. It's oh, very, very bottom. You can kind of see it. <laughs> this was before I got my actual video camera. This is just my little digital camera. And like Dan said, document everything. Go get a camera. Document everything. Um, so yeah, the, there's the helicopter spraying. I'm standing in front of my house. Um, so, um... This particular spray right here um, <clears throat> triggered the action, and um, I immediately got a hold of Oregon Department of Forestry. They were really nice to me at first, <laughs> gave me all this <laughs> literature. <laughs> um, so it was awesome. So then I learned a bunch of stuff, and um, I did my own mass mailing, trying to let my neighbors know, hey, they're about to come spray all this nasty stuff. Well, I didn't really get much feedback from that other than that's when I got hooked up with um, Day Owen and the Pitchfork Rebellion and then so that group got me to also go um, to the Board of Forestry and so our work there has gone quite a ways actually um, through that we were able to um, get the Board of Forestry to come out here and tour this place because some of those board members uh, live in the city so I don't think that they actually saw that. That's Triangle Lake to show you just how close that they're spraying to Triangle Lake and how fast the wind is going, 15 miles per hour. And these are all clearly spray violations. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll get the, the, the sound will come on afterwards. This is actually the Gypsy Moth spray over Eugene neighborhoods. And this was my, this was my first real pesticide exposure was this right here. What were they spraying? DTK? DTK. And um, <laughs> it was harsh. I, I couldn't breathe very well. I felt very fatigued. It, it was it was not pretty. Um, my partner told me, you need to go outside and get some fresh air. <laughs> Move around and clear my system, you know, the, the nastiness. So, um, so, um, finding out about the Forest Practices Act and how bad they were, um, the BOF had an issue scan. The Board of Forestry had an issue scan, and the number one <laughs> the, the number one issue was pesticides. And um, twice, yeah, it is true, twice. The issue scan. The issue scan is what the Board of Forestry has to try to figure out what the top issue is of everybody. I'm not quite sure how to explain that. Complaints, the count complaints. Right, right, okay. So, mm -hmm. and so through the issue scan, again, pesticides came up as a, as a big issue, and 
so many people. I, I joined this battle and everybody just came out of the woodwork who's been trying to work on this same issue. Um, <coughs> so the Board of Forestry, um, I go to every meeting that I can. Um, as a grassroots effort, you have to go to all the meetings you can. Um, because you make a difference just being in the room. Um, a Board of Forestry member uh, did tell me that he was able to bring up a particular issue because we were in the room. It, we, gi we give them confidence because they're kind of in the minority that the environmental people in the Board of Forestry, so obviously. Um, this particular spray right here was actually investigated because it did rain heavily after this. And I mean, all these, um, parcels that you'll see in this little video here uh, are along Fish Creek, which is the little river I live on, which empties into Lake Creek, which then empties into the Sayusla. What month of the year was that? Um, the first one's March. This one's August 28, 2009. You can kind of see the rain in the clouds because right after this it starts pouring rain. Um, so um, as, a, as grassroots accomplishments through all of this, we actually have the BOF, Board of Forestry, I like to use the acronyms. Uh, <laughs> we got them to come out to tour the area. Uh, we actually yeah, got the EPA to come out here and tour the area also. Um, and I, is anybody, are, are you guys all familiar with the Triangle Lake investigation going on, exposure investigation? <clears throat> so a bunch of us, knowing that we've been exposed, decided, um, well, the biggest thing is we need to be tested. So. We just happened to find um, a doctor who volunteered her time and her lab to take urine samples and analyze them, and we all came up positive for 2,4-D and atrazine, including my children. Um, this is the most recent uh, spray right here, just this uh, last April. And um, so with those results from the Dana Barr study, we took these results to the Board of Forestry and said, here you go, here's proof of exposure. And through that, the governor said, you know, so there needs to be an exposure investigation. So that's, so the inv exposure investigation began and there was a first round of participants. Many of us who were in the Dana Barr study were participants in the first round and they took urine samples and environmental samples. Um, all the participants that I know of came up positive for 2,4-D again. They keep claiming that these um, pesticides leave your body in a timely manner, but seeing as now we've been tested three times for some of us, because Dana Barr took two samples, pre and post spray, and there was a spike, huge spike in some of us in the atrazine and 2,4-D. You can see them spraying right on the road right there. Okay, so. This is the part I want you to hear. <coughs> this is what we're up against out there. Can you hear that? Yeah, I don't know if you all just heard that, but that was Weyerhaeuser threatening our life with a sniper gun, saying they would bring the sniper gun next day. Um, I was recording, of course, I'm documenting everything. Um, I'm recording them and uh, I show them and they see me recording and they know I was, I've already called into Weyerhaeuser that day and everything. So, um, so anyway, that's what we're dealing with out there. Um, it's true, the threat is, it's, it's absolutely out there. Um, and like I said, I document everything. I have a CB, so I knew they were talking about us on the CB, so I put my <laughs> camera on the CB and first record and listened to them for a while, and that's what I got. Oh, that's great. Um, Did you so submit that to the law enforcement? No, we haven't sent. Um, no, we haven't really sent it off to law enforcement. We let Warehouser know about it, and um, they don't talk very often on their CBs anymore unless it's <laughs> about business. Um, but anyway. I, so we decided to do our own water quality testing because the state won't do it. So I, we got our own equipment and um, we are testing our water for safe parameters all the time. Because the states um, test the water for safe parameters, but they don't test for pesticides or fertilizers or anything like that. Um, so we've gone ahead and we've done that ourselves also. Um, I also joined the Watershed Council back when I first began. 
thinking I could get somewhere with them. <laughs> Seeing as Timber pretty much has their claws in the Watershed Council too, I couldn't get anywhere there. Um, so with Beyond Toxics, we're going to start a water quality monitoring program, um, and I think that'll be really successful. Um, grassroots. Uh, <laughs> anyway, if you have any questions, let me know. I just uh, my, my biggest advice is to go to every meeting that you can and document everything because it does make a huge difference, your presence, and you can't give up because that's what they want you to do. They For that, then, are you? No, uh-uh. Um, the um, the state investigation, exposure investigation, tested our soil, our water, eggs from our chickens, vegetation. It all came up negative except for one interesting point. In Mazapir, which is very highly mobile in soil and water, um, those particular results um, came out void, which means there is an error, so nothing was actually analyzed. But your drinking water and well is, is negative, is that correct? They were negative, correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we all believe that we are being exposed to the air. Revolatization, 2,4-D is highly volatile. Um, and it mass appear uh, moves quite quickly. Now, one interesting thing is I documented um, a hack and squirt, where they hack into the tree and then squirt it to kill it. I, um, I documented that right behind the school, Triangle Lake School. The hill right behind that was clear cut. I, I documented that. And, um, <clears throat> and then right afterwards, uh, we got the well water at the school tested, and it came up positive for Mazapir, and that is what they sprayed right before that. Um, however, the school officials and all that said, well, it's below the safety, you know, the amount specified for safety and drinking water. So it's okay. Your kids can go to school seven days a week, drink that water with the Mazapir, and you'll be fine. I don't believe that, obviously. But, um, These so tests weren't for, for the herbicide, is that correct, at the school? Or well is what you're talking about now? Yeah, the school well was tested, and um, it came up positive for a Mazapir. For atrazine and... No, 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 imazapir. Some other herbicide. Yeah, yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. And imazapir um, was also listed on the very lame spray notice. And this um, imazapir, the spray notice, uh, a helicopter came and sprayed a ridge right near my house two days before they came and took the environmental samples for my house. And on the spray notice it says that one of the chemicals they may have used was imazapir. And imazapir is what came up void on my environmental results. To me, that's not quite a coincidence. Um, <clears throat> ODA was the one who um, sampled the environmental results, and ODA has a long history of losing samples, you know, accidentally being contaminated. Um, so we don't really trust ODA too much. That's Oregon Department of Agriculture, by the way. Can I, can I say something? Yeah, go for it. Um, if, if, if you know that you're going to be sprayed and, and you believe that there will be drift, it's a good idea to contact ODA ahead of time and ask them to, con to work with the applicator on that unit. And, and the ODA, in theory, will come out, they'll take samples before the spray, they'll, take, they'll watch during the spray, including videotaping if you ask them to probably, and they will then take samples after the spray. And for the most <coughs> part, in the past, they've used this tool to try to exonerate the applicators. But if you believe that, you've, that, that you'll be able to show that there is something there, ideally you'd hire your own agronomist as well to, take, to follow the same procedures so they can compare notes and send it to a different lab and all this, but because the ODA Pesticides Division does all the analysis on all the samples collected by the state. But that, w that would be your best deal in court in, tr in a trespass case to prove that you were trespassed is to have the state do the capture the samples and, and present them. Um, it, it's awfully hard to walk into a courthouse and prove that you haven't manipulated the results somehow of the jury. So ideally you would have the state on your side on this. It's going to be hard to do that because there is a revolving door between all of the state agencies involved in pesticides and the, and the companies that spray this stuff. Mm -hmm. They all want jobs down the road. Well, ODA I believe I'm going to put 
Tom, Dr. Curran, the question uh, in charge of questions, please raise your hand and feel free to talk to our wonderful panelists who I thank afterwards. I'd like to ask this gentleman a question about the ODA. Will they come out and test pre and after on private land? So, for instance, a timber company is spraying their own land. Will it's they possible. Test? It's possible that they will. Um, and that would be your best bet. Mm -hmm. if, if you're very friendly and nice and <laughs> to in, the OBA. innocent, mm -hmm. innocent <laughs> yeah, that, that would be your best bet. Uh -oh. So when they said it was uh, the school, that chemical was in the school well, they said, oh, it's below the level of safety. Right. Mm -hmm. Is, did they actually determine what levels were safe for small children? Um, I, I don't think so. In fact, on my... Um, on our urine results that we got back from the state investigation, my children were part of the state investigation also. Um, the adults, you know, they could place in like, and were above or below the 95th percentile. There are no comparisons for children. They, they just haven't done that yet, I guess. You know, that I, I know. Of. And I just want to say something else. Seneca sent us a notice they're going to spray atrazine 240 next to us. And so I called him up and said, oh, let us know when that's going to happen. And by the way, I said, did you hear about the Triangle Lake? And now we don't want to be contaminated. Did you hear about the Triangle Lake test? And the guy, his name is Adam Smith from Seneca, he says, oh, yeah, we've heard about that. But that's because they ate too many apples <laughs> before they were tested. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, you are organic eaters. Right? <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah. Almost all of us out there. Go ahead. You're saying that the lake itself hasn't been tested for 17 years? The lake like itself hasn't been tested since the 70s is what I could find. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, um, trout, do they accumulate the pesticides as, as it all comes down since they're high on the food tra chain, and who would you have test the trout in the lake? Um, that I wouldn't know. Maybe uh, the Department of uh, Fish, Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife yeah. perhaps. Um, I know they just um, up the criteria for fish consumption and the toxins within the, the fish, they, they decrease it for, do you see what I'm saying? Because they know it accumulates in the fish, so. A lot of these pesticides bioaccumulate, which yeah. means they, yeah. they just continuously build up in the fatty tissue of the fish over time. So uh, mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't eat any fish out of Triangle Lake yeah, or any tributaries. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't oh, either. Sure. Uh, I wouldn't even come close to it. I have a question for the attorney. Two <laughs> this one here. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Coos County and I'm a gatekeeper and the quick cut cutting behind me and, and uh, behind me 35 acres per cut that just in the last uh, 34 days and, uh, and the first week of August, the third week of August, I see the week as well and back and forth and I met all these people from uh, Long Rock Timber, you know, all these people, they're good people and they work hard. I just want to see their side of the view. I'm going to treat her and uh, and uh, I seen a bunch of trucks go up later on in the between the first and third week of August. And I went up there, I walked up to the holdings there, and there were trucks in the, in the, in the landing there. And, and the beer picked up clicking and tapping, you know. And there were three pickups there. And they had two and a half gallon containers of address in, in there. And I took one of the labels off and covered them. And I walked back down the road, I was going to walk back to my car, and uh, I, I met a man who was tapping down there, and I looked, and so I took my stick and I tapped, and, and I said, well, don't bother you, you're working. So he come up and talked to me, he was the, uh, his name was, uh, I have his name, he was the, uh, he's in charge of the uh, spraying and the burning and uh, the tree climbing, and they have a bunch of Mexicans who are in there doing this, they play with scalp. They, they had this all laid out to see it, and they went in there and scalped all these hardwoods. And they scalped them, mm -hmm. and they had a spray bottle with them with the in it, and they sprayed it down there. Yes, that's and what then, I was talking about earlier. And yeah. anyway, I wasn't notified, of it, but I let these people go through it. And before that, yeah. then, then about uh, last week, uh, what's the question? September. I want to know if I should have been notified about that form that they were doing. Well, to get notified, like I was saying, you actually have to pay for a subscription. So you'll have to know if they don't have to tell you nothing. They don't have to That's tell you correct. anything. That's right, Roger. That is the nothing. big problem. They have You have to pay for it, 25 bucks, and then they'll give you it. And probably what you would have seen is a time frame of many months, and they probably would have listed atropine along with 10 other chemicals, and it wouldn't have been cleared on. You had no idea. So that has to be done for the Department of Yep. I have a question yep. about yep. spray notification. Like, if I want to spend a bunch of money and 
subscribe. What's the rule then for me then redistributing that information? You can redistribute as much as you want. You pay for it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. They tell you not to. Okay. I mean, not that that solves the whole problem at all, yeah. but I just wanted to make sure yeah. that I started telling everybody. Uh, I, I heard that atrazine is manufactured in Switzerland, but it's illegal to use it in Switzerland. In fact, it's banned everywhere in Europe. Pretty soon they'll find out. Is that, is that common, common herbicide in Oregon? Atrazine? Atrazine is one of the favorite. Probably the most common. It is one of the ones that doesn't have a very short half-life. They start more of a persistent, you know, they don't It's an endocrine disruptor, too. It doesn't say on the label it has to be applied. No further than 10 feet off the ground. Right. Unfortunately, unfortunately, label requirements cannot be enforced by citizens. Only the federal government can do a label of enforcement action. So he says go to court. You, you, can't go, you just told us you can't go to court. Exactly. Let me explain. There, there is a very tiny sliver of possibility without having that statute declared unconstitutional. And it has to do with the labels, actually, because one of the, one of the definitions of the accepted practices are that it has to be in compliance with law. Every pesticide and herbicide label, every single one that's approved by the EPA says how it's limited in drift and uh, off gassing and bike you know if, if they're spraying a half a mile from you and you're getting it on your property it's in violation of that label and my contention is it's in violation of law uh, unfortunately to this point nobody is succeeding with a legal determination by the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court that says that's what that means but that's a contention I would make. The, the problem is, there's another part of the Freedom to Farm and Freedom of Forestry Act that I didn't put up there, and it's the scariest part. And that is, if you sue somebody, even if you've got a valid case, but you lose, you have to pay their attorney fees. And believe me, Weyerhaeuser can build up about $75,000 in attorney fees in a week. Yeah, I'll go to Davis Wright Germain and come right after you. Yeah. So our legislature is basically betrayed us. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> special interest <laughs> lobbying at its finest. Long ago. Yeah. If anyone's looking for CLE credit, the sun is here. There's one more over here. But. Okay, let's just, so we'll say we're done. And yeah. We'll hang around for a while. I have to go, unfortunately. I'm sorry.